Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. While you're being seated, would you give it up for our worship band this morning? Amazing. Mandy, you kill it every time. Lynn, my favorite. Man, if you don't know Lynn, you need to get to know him. He's great. Man, I'm so pumped to be here at Overflow Church. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to start out the New Year. I love New Year's. As much as I love Christmas and Easter, I love New Year's because in New Year's, we all share things in common. Um, we're all broke, first of all, because Christmas just happened. Uh, everybody in here, well, maybe about half of us at least, are sore because this is our first week in the gym for like an entire year. Half the congregation right now isn't eating any carbs because we're on the keto diet, right? I know, I know who you are. And, uh, and lastly, we're all reading Genesis and Matthew because we started our Bible plans, the ones that we quit last year in February. <laughs> We've restarted them, and we're all back in Matthew and Genesis, and we're all reading the same stuff. So um, I love the New Year's. Uh, before we get into the service today, I would like to introduce, um, of course, Josh already said it, but um, my dad and my brother and my wife, um, Sam, they've been here before, but I want to introduce, I've got my entire family. Now, it's a long story, and it's an amazing story, but uh, like literally my whole family's here this morning. So right here in the second row, I find my mom, Tina, my sister, Audrey, my brother, Avery, Audrey's boyfriend, Blake, and in the row sitting behind him, we find uh, my stepmom, Michelle, my little sister, Selah, my brother, Ethan, my sister, Anna Claire, and my dad, Tommy. So would you guys, just because I'm the one speaking, would you guys give it up for him real quick? Thank you. I love them. Wouldn't, wouldn't be here without them. And it's, uh, it's their first time, actually, for a lot of them. It's their first experience here at Overflow. And uh, if it's your first experience today, um, you wouldn't know this. But for those of us who it's not your first experience, you know that we have been in the middle of a series called Unconventional Christmas. Now, conventionally, any other church in the entire world, in America, ends their Christmas series on Christmas, but I figured in the name of unconventional Christmas that you guys would be okay if we extended our series two weeks longer than any church in the entire country. So if you didn't know, this today is actually our last sermon within the series of unconventional Christmas, but I love it. I love that we're extending our Christmas series longer than anybody else because as Southerners, I sometimes feel like we have a reputation for extending the Christmas season longer than most. I don't know if you guys, now I, my knowledge, and I've been wondering what the difference is right now. I don't have my glasses on. I can't see anybody. I'm like, what's happening? Um, my knowledge of country music is limited, but of the country songs that I do know, and I don't know what this says about me, but I've heard, and I know the song Redneck Woman, by Gretchen Wilson. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the song Redneck Woman. Yeah, everybody. We're from McKenzie, right? And we all know that song. We live that song. We are that song. Um, in, in that song, she makes the reference of, in, in saying that she is so Southern and so country that she what? That she leaves her Christmas lights on her front porch all year long. And we all know and can relate to that. We're like, yes, that is something that I see every time. You can drive down any road, whether you're from Gleason, McKenzie, uh, Dresden, South Fulton, wherever you're at, drive down any road, I guarantee you, you will see Christmas trees and houses still through their front windows. You'll see wreaths on the door. You'll see inflatables in the yard. You will see lights up on the houses. In fact, last year, Sam and I, my wife, we were culprits of this. Uh, this was last year, not this past Christmas, but the one before that was our first Christmas as a married couple. <laughs> we lived in a duplex and we decided that we wanted to decorate for Christmas. We were just going to go for it. We wanted more than a tree. And so we put up our lights. And if you lived in a duplex, you know that if you want to decorate the duplex, you only decorate like half of it. So you see a house and it's like lights, 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 lights. stop, no decorations at all on this side. So we decorate our house. It looks great. Our little side of our duplex is it's amazing, and Christmas came, and then Christmas went, and the conversation happened over and over. Hey, Alex, when are you going to get out there and take those lights down? And it was like, uh, as soon as it's not raining anymore. And then it wasn't raining, and it was like, Alex, when are you going to get out there and take those lights down? And I was like, well, as soon as, as it warms up. But then March came, 
and it hadn't warmed up at all, and the lights were still on the house, and I'm sure some of our neighbors wanted to say this to us, and I'm going to have you do this. Say, just look at a neighbor right now today, this morning, and say, it's time to take down the decorations. It's beautiful. I love how you guys are so engaged. Uh, you guys love that. Some of you need to call your neighbor right now and be like, hey, tune in to Overflow's live stream. Like, it, literally, please, it's time for you to take down your decorations. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12 today, uh, verse 43. I'll give you guys a second to uh, turn there. If you have your Bibles in here, lift them up this morning. Right? Everybody that's lifting your Bibles up, turn and give everyone else a really religious glare who didn't bring their Bibles. I'm just messing with you guys. If you didn't bring it, uh, you can look up here on the screen. Uh, to warn you, before we go into this verse, I want to give you a little bit of, uh, uh, and maybe lift your anticipation to read this verse. This is a really unconventional verse to read for a Christmas series, okay? But if you trust me, I feel like that the Lord has something that he wants to say to us this morning through this verse. So trust me um, and roll with me this morning as we read this. So we're going to start Matthew 12, verse 43, and this is what it says. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest, and it doesn't find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes, and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And that's how it will be with this wicked generation. And I'm laughing because if there was like a manual on like what verses not to preach at a church who doesn't know you very well, this verse, it's probably right there on the list of like, Alex, this is a scary and intimidating verse. Probably shouldn't preach that one, but we're going to preach it anyways this morning. And uh, it is scary and it is uh, intimidating and it's probably confusing a little bit. And for years I missed out on the concept that Jesus was trying to get through through this verse. Um, like many of you probably this morning, I was a bit distracted when I started reading about evil spirits living in somebody and then seven evil spirits living in somebody and then this generation is going to be more wicked than any other generation. And I read all that and I got a little bit distracted and I missed out on what Jesus was trying to say through the verse altogether. In fact, most scholars would even say that on the surface level, it's strange that Jesus even inserts this verse where he does. He's having a full-blown conversation with some people, and then all of a sudden, he's like, there's a man who's infested with a demon. And you're like, whoa, that was kind of like a hard shift in the left direction, Jesus. Why is it there? But on the surface level, it is hard to understand why he says that, but when we dig a little bit deeper, it's easier to understand. And, and I want to be very clear I, in no way this morning, am attempting to discredit the reality of evil spirits or, or um, their existence. Because as much as we believe in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and angels, we, if we believe in that, we have to believe in the other side. But the problem for us is that talking about and preaching about that is more uncommon for us than it was for them. The, the day and ages that they lived in, that was something that they saw all the time. It was something that they communicated about all the time. It was something that they had daily interaction with us. And while we don't have daily interaction with that kind of stuff, if we are all willing to be honest. Now, I know that none of you are like me, having grown up in church, and sometimes have an issue being honest of some of the stuff that we're going through because we like looking good for everybody. I know that that's probably only something that I deal with. But if we are willing to be honest with ourselves, I would bet that everybody sitting in this room has our fair share of personal demons that we struggle with. Now, whether those demons are literally evil spirits or not, I'm, I'm not to say, but for many of us, those demons may resemble something closer to depression, stress, anxiety, addiction, pornography, poor financial decision-making, temper, who knows? But we're reading a story right now about a man who is struggling 
with some personal demons that he can't seem to shake. And instead of seeking help, instead of dealing with his issues or these demons surrounding his personal life, instead of dealing with his dysfunction, we find him decorating his dysfunction. Now, if you would, let me explain what I mean. In verse 44, it says concerning this guy's life, not, not just the demon's home, not just the evil spirit's home, but this guy's life, that it was empty. It, some versions say unoccupied. Uh, but it says it was empty, it was swept clean, and it was put in order. I want to focus on that word put in order. Just say what we say, put in order. That word put in order, it's maybe not the best translation of the word. If you go back to the original Greek meaning, the, the, the best translation of this word isn't actually put in order. It's the word decorated. So we could just as well read this verse concerning this guy's life and say that, you know, in the middle of, of these demons that he's dealing with, his life is empty, it's swept clean, and it's decorated. It's decorated. So in response to all of this stuff, instead of attempting to grow, instead of attempting to walk in the life that God has for him, instead of attempting to deal with some of the stuff that's going on that he knows probably shouldn't be there, we find this guy putting up decorations and calling it good enough. Now, last time I was here, if you weren't here, I told a story about my family's traditions when it came time for Christmas. How many of you lived in a family where you decorated when it came time for Christmas? Like your house, you know, there, hey, we have way more in this crowd who decorated for Christmas. So uh, I did as well, but we didn't just decorate. It wasn't like we put a wreath on the door and called it, called it done. My family went all out. We had the lights, we had the inflatables, we had the manger scene. We had fake snow on the ground. We had the village on the inside of our house. You know the little villages that, that light up and you sit them on your dressers or something? We had the villages not even, like, like it wasn't just the outside of our house. Even our coffee cups changed when it came time for Christmas. Like we had normal coffee cups, then we had like the Santa coffee cups. They were full of like red and green M&Ms the, the entire year. Um, you know, of course, we, we went all out. We did it big. And it wasn't just because we liked doing it big. It was because in my town, the huge town of South Fulton, Tennessee, we had a competition where they would send someone from the newspaper, and I don't know whose job that is, but I would love to be the person who gets to do this. And this person would drive around, and they would look at all the houses that were decorated, and they would judge all the houses. And whoever won got $100, which is a scam, because it costs more than $100 to even run your electricity bill during that time if you have up that many lights. But, but the real prize here, because we're from South Fulton, the real prize was that you got your picture on the front page of the newspaper. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's what we all aspired to do. And so one year, we all decided, and by we all, I mean my stepdad decided because he was the one doing all the work. We all decided that we were going to go all out. We were done getting second and third place, that we were gonna crush the competition, and we were going to have the greatest decorated house in the entire town. And so, like, like usual, we put up all of our stuff, we went all out, we did everything even better than we had ever done before, but to top it all off, we did something different. My stepdad, Shane, went and he got this giant piece of wood the size of like a basketball backboard, and he painted it white, and he put it up on the side of the house, and he painted John 3.16 on this, this big piece of wood. And uh, we ended up winning the competition. And people, and this funny note, we won the competition, and when they came to take our picture for the front page of the paper, mom was like not in makeup, and she was still babysitting my little sister, and they're like, hey, we want you to come take this picture. And so we have this old picture, I wish I had it today, of her in the front yard. She's like... She's so sad that she's having to take this picture. But we ended up winning, and uh, we won, and most people believe we won because of the sign. Like, it became a thing in our town. Like, have you seen the John 316 house, right? To my dismay, my house became the John 316 house in our town. And I say, you know, I mean, we lived on a busy road. 
Like for some of you live out in the country. If you put that on your house, no one would even see it. I lived on the same road as the police station. People took my road to get to school so everyone saw it. And I say to my dismay, because when it came time to take down the decorations, not only did they take the lights down, but that sign got left up there for two years. The sign never got taken down. And at the time when I was in high school, I wasn't really concerned about God. So having a John 316 sign on the side of my house was pretty uncool, to be honest with you. That's really what I was concerned with at that point in my life. And I know some of you are like, what? That's so nice. Like your family, they have a sign on the outside of your house, a hand-painted John 316 sign. That's, that's so wonderful. And I'm like, yeah, it is nice. Until you're a 16-year-old trying to get like a good night kiss. And the girl says no because John 3.16 is looking her in the face. And you're like, oh, gosh, take the sign down. And then, you know, it's, it's really nice until the, the senior football player who you're trying to become friends with drops you off at your house. And when he pulls into your yard, he goes, oh, you live in the John 316 house. And he starts apologizing for the music that he's playing. You know, you're like, ah, like, dad, like, please take down the sign. And it was nice. And, uh, and, it, and it must have portrayed a beautiful picture of who our family was. You know, like, you're not, you don't drive by a house. Like, some houses, you've seen them. They have, like, the little yard uh, signs where you stick in your yard and it says like ADT, no, this house is protected by the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, they have signs like that and you're like, you're like, okay, well, if I'm going to steal a house, I, you know, if I'm going to rob a house, I know which one I'm going to, the one without security. You know, like you see signs and, and you think, man, these people must really love God. And I'm assuming that people would drive by our house and think, dude, this family has it all together. Like they're doing it right. They're willing to put up a John 316 sign. Uh, on the outside of their house. And while you would think it portrayed a beautiful picture of what was going on behind the scenes, if you were to take a closer look at the family that was living in that house, my stepdad, who, who now, man, he is on fire for God. He planted a church in Martin. It's the church I'm still youth pastor in right now. He's doing amazing things. But at the time, he was running from the call of God on his life, running from ministry. He was even mad at God because of some miscarriages that my mom had gone through earlier that year. My mom, who had gone through the multiple miscarriages, was dealing with a depression that she had never experienced before. And then myself, who ironically lived on the other side of that sign, lived in the room right behind that sign, I was shoulder deep in insecurity. I, my entire life revolved around what other people thought about me. I was all but addicted to pornography. I was trying drugs for the first time. I was drinking for the first time. I was sneaking out of the house on a regular basis. And by the time I was 16 years old, I had a DUI. And I know some of you are probably thinking, why would you put your family out there like that? Like, they're all sitting here in front of you, Alex. Like, why would you do that? And, uh, and I agree with you. It is, it's their story to tell. But I've asked them before if I'm... You know, if I can tell this story, and they've said yes, and uh, one because they're past that. That's not that's not their story anymore. But two, it's because they know, and I believe they know the concept that Jesus is trying to tell in this verse that we read, and it's that the first step toward overcoming our issues is the willingness to admit that we even have issues. <laughs> Yeah, it's really hard sometimes. It's really, really hard sometimes. A lot of times it's way easier to just act like everything is going good behind the scenes than to bring it out into the light, than to be honest about what's actually happening in our lives and in our families. And uh, How many of you, uh, no, no shame at all, because I've been here too. How many of you have ever been involved with the Celebrate Recovery? Anybody? Yeah, uh, would you give it up? Would you give it up for all of our Celebrate Recovery people in here? I... Uh, I've been involved with the ministry the past couple of weeks where I've been in some Celebrate Recovery meetings. Um, I actually had to attend AA classes when I got that DUI, not because I was an alcoholic, but because it was mandatory. Uh, funny story, I actually remember my dad, he was the one that had to take me to these classes. It was all the way in Paducah. And it was the first time I ever heard this come out of his mouth. He said, uh, he said Alex, it's the only time you're ever going to hear me say this, but uh, don't make any friends today. And I was like, oh, yeah, yes, I feel you on that. But uh, this... 
This, if you ever go into a Celebrate Recovery uh, class or an AA class or an NA or anything like that, this is how, um, this is how they'll open up class. If I was in it, this is what I would do. I'd get up there and I would say, uh, hey guys, my name is Alex Gallion. Uh, I still deal with insecurity sometimes. Um, I used to be addicted to pornography. I have control issues. Um, I'm sometimes still intimidated by strong male leadership. And I deal with a good bit of church hurt from some experiences in my past. And right now, someone's like leaning over to their wife. They're like, hey, just go ahead and uh, get your purse. We're going we're gonna to head out now because uh, I don't know who it is up there speaking, but I'm not sure if I feel comfortable with our kids being in this room. And while I understand, can we just decide today that we're going to be a church that embraces the struggle, that embraces people who don't have it all together, that embraces the fact that everybody in this room in some way is broken and is going to make mistakes. Are we going to be that church? You know what I'm saying? Like, let's decide this year that that is who Overflow Church. It's going to be a church where broken people can come and feel like they are accepted. And I, and I love Celebrate Recovery because they understand that concept and they preach this. They preach that if we want victory over our shortcomings, our first step is the willingness to admit that we even have shortcomings. But we're reading this story about this guy, and this dude is completely unwilling to admit that he even has shortcomings. He is unwilling to address the problems in his life. And this, this guy didn't want to deal with his problems, so instead of dealing with the issues, instead of trying to grow, he settled for decorating his life in a way where it just looked like he didn't have issues at all. And isn't this a good picture of our lives? Sometimes we, we deal with things and we have struggles and we're so afraid of people knowing that we're going through that stuff and we're sometimes so unwilling to change that instead of even trying to deal with that stuff, instead of addressing the problems, all we do sometimes is we just we settle for attending Sunday morning church. You know, we settle for attending Sunday services, or we get involved with a small group, or we serve within our church. Or if you're a millennial like myself, sometimes you don't do any of that. You just start dressing in a different way. You know what I'm saying? You get saved, and all of a sudden your whole wardrobe changes, or you start following the right Christian speakers. And you start following the right ministries and we plaster our social media pages with Bible verses, you know, so that everybody on the outside knows that we're Christians. Like they wouldn't actually know if they met us, but if they get on our Instagram, they're gonna see our bio and they're gonna know that we know John 3, 16. Like we, we know Romans 6 and what it means to us. And we, and we start listening to like the cool Christian music. And while none of that is bad, Okay, I strongly encourage everybody in here to attend Sunday services and to get involved and to be in a small group and to, to serve. And, and I mean, I strongly encourage you, if you want to dress better, dress better and, and listen to the great Christian music and, and do all of that. But that's not what the problem is. The problem is when we're doing all of that, but meanwhile, our day-to-day -day lives haven't changed a bit. The problem resides when we have been attending church for two years, and the same problems we had and the same issues we were dealing with on the day when we started attending church are the same problems we are still dealing with and the same issues we are still dealing with every single day still. I have a hunch, and I'm afraid that not just for my generation, but the church as a whole, that we have become really good at looking the part, while in reality, we are not actually the part. I'm concerned that for a lot of us, we haven't allowed God to heal the places that need to be healed. I'm concerned that we haven't forgiven where we needed to forgive. I'm concerned that we've got dark places in our life that we haven't allowed God to put his hand on. I'm, I'm concerned that we're good at looking the part and maybe we haven't actually become the people that we're supposed to be. I know I've, I've been in this situation before in my own life where I haven't actually laid down my life 
right? Lay down the stuff that, that I'm dealing with. Lay down who I am and my dreams, my aspirations, my, 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 the things I like doing, the sins that I deal with. I haven't laid down my life. I've just gotten really good at decorating my life in a way where it looks like it's laid down. But that's not the gospel because Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, then you have to be willing to lay down your life because until we lay down our lives, we don't get the lives that he has to offer for us. But laying down our lives, laying down our sins, the things that we like, the things that maybe no one even knows about, that is hard. And I've been there. It's, it's way harder to, to actually lay those things down than it is to just decorate our lives in a way where it looks like we've laid them down. So a lot of times instead of laying our lives down, what we do is we go get our John 3.16 sign and we get our Christian clothes and we make our Christian post and we attend church and you know we, we put it on our, our Facebook pages that we love God and we get our sign and we put it on the outside of our lives so that from a distance, everything looks good. But if somebody were to go behind that sign and see what was happening behind the scenes, what would they see? I want you guys to shout this with me this morning and just say, it's time... To take down down the decorations. decorations. Now, he didn't just decorate his life. It says he did. But there was more. It says that he swept clean. He swept his life clean. And I love that it uses this word, swept clean. Because a lot of times I have been under this illusion before, many times actually, that Jesus came so that we could clean up our lives. And get our acts together. And while it sounds good on the surface, that also is not the gospel. Because you want to know what it looks like when we just try and clean up our lives? Uh, it looks like this verse that we just read, right? This guy, he, he cleaned his life up. He started getting his stuff together and trying to do the right thing and look like how it was supposed to look for everybody. And for a season, it was fantastic. It was clean. It was wonderful. It looked like a functioning house, you know, looked like a functioning life. But then in the long run, he ended up worse in the end than he was in the beginning. In the beginning, he was only dealing with one demon. But when he just tried to clean up his own life, he ends up dealing with seven demons. We all know the person that, and for many of us, we've been the person who has, um, started coming to church. We know the things we're not supposed to be doing, things we're supposed to be doing. And we start trying to clean up our life and get, get our acts together and really blend in to, to church culture. And um, they, they start coming on Sundays and they get really involved in a small group and they're serving and they're here and they're on the front row. Not to call out anybody on the front row this morning. We're just, we love you guys. Um, they're on the front row. And then after a while, their social media pages start changing a little bit. And then they start making some questionable decisions and and we're peering in from a distance, seeing it. And then now they're not at church as much. And now when they are, they're kind of in the back. And then about a year down the road, they're not at church at all. And they are further from having a walk with God then than they were in the very beginning. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. I've been there since I've said yes to to following Jesus, to to getting saved. I have found myself in a spot where I look in the mirror and I'm like, Alex, what are you doing? This, you didn't even do this kind of stuff before you got saved. What's happening now? And the reason that we end up in that spot is because we are just trying to clean up our lives on our own. But hear me when I say this, because it's the truth. Jesus did not come to clean up your old life. He came to give you a brand new life. Jesus Jesus is not a repairman. Like He did not come to repair man. You know what I'm saying? He didn't come with duct tape and with band-aids to come and fix everything that that we were doing wrong. Jesus is the creator of all the world. Jesus takes from scratch and makes something perfect. God in the Bible, it it never says that God, that his job is to fix all the things that we break. The Bible says that God makes all things brand new. If you're having marriage problems today, 
He doesn't just want to fix your marriage. He wants to make it brand new. He wants people to be able to look at your marriage and say, I have no idea what happened to them, but that looks like a totally new couple right there. If you're having trouble and you're finding yourself in constant debt, he doesn't just want to bail you out of debt. He wants to give us a new mindset on money management. God, if, if you, I, I don't know if your relationship's broken with a loved one, right? He doesn't just want to fix that. He wants to come and give you a new relationship. Maybe you find yourself today mad at God because of situations in your life. He doesn't just want to fix y'all's relationship. He wants to give you a new, vibrant, fresh relationship with him. Maybe today you find yourself addicted. Hear me. He doesn't just want to fix that thing so that you can manage your addiction. He wants to set you free from that addiction. And it, although for some of us it may look like a process, for some of you today, your, your addiction, he wants to set you free completely in one day, in one moment, to be able to deal with something when you walked in the door, but for you to be able to walk out the door and never deal with it again. When you step into a relationship with Jesus, hello, have you ever thought, in fact, about why God refers to salvation as being born again? Like, it's a weird term. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't hear it anywhere else. Have you ever actually put your mind in, in like, thought about why does he call it being born again? He calls it being born again because we were too messed up to simply fix. Sometimes you take your car to a mechanic to get it fixed, and sometimes you have to purchase a brand new car because it's beyond repair. Colossians says that when Jesus stepped out of heaven, he came to purchase us back from sin, to give us a brand new life. When you step into a relationship with Jesus, you don't just get your old life fixed. You get to step into a fresh, never before worn, clean, crispy, brand new life. I mentioned a part of my testimony. If the band wants to come up here today, we're about to, um, we're about to end this thing. I mentioned a, a, a part of my testimony earlier where whenever I was 16, I was dealing with, with all that stuff. And, uh, and I ended up getting a DUI by the time I was, I was 16. We'll, we'll go to the point where I got the DUI and fast forward about four months from there. About four months from there, I found myself in a service that looked just like this. And I found myself coming to the realization that all the cleaning up I was trying to do wasn't getting me anywhere. I, I wasn't successful in any of that. I found myself at the realization that all the decorating I had done so that no one would see what was actually happening in my life, it wasn't doing me any good. And I found myself broken. And I remember the pastor telling me, giving me this opportunity to come down front and answer this altar call. And he said, he said today, he was like, if you answer this call, you answer this call to follow Jesus. He was like, all that stuff that you're dealing with, he was like, he wants to set you free from it. And he's gonna pour out his love on you. And I remember for the first time being willing to take down my decoration, to not care about what everybody in the, the room thought about me and who I was. And I remember for the first time in my life, wanting God more than I wanted the approval of my friends or my parents. And I remember coming out from behind my seat. And I remember getting on my knees, coming down to the altar, much like this, getting on my knees, crying, Repenting of my sin, just saying, God, I'm sorry for who I've been. I'm sorry for the life I've been living. And I remember for the first time in my entire life, feeling the love of God come over the top of me, feeling the love of God in my heart, feeling his mercy in a way that I had never felt it. I remember standing up from that altar that day, a brand new boy. And I want to invite you guys to stand up with me today as we're about to go. And I didn't just stand up from that altar, a brand new man. I, I went into my high school that year, a brand new man. And I went into my family that year as, as a brand new brother and as a brand new son. And I went into the rest of my life as brand new. And for some of you today, this is your brand new moment. This is your defining moment. You've never said yes to the call of Jesus. You've never officially gotten saved and accepted him as your savior. And today, I want to offer that to you. Maybe you've tried to clean up your life. 
Maybe you've tried to do some things and to get right and to get back on track and it hasn't worked. And today you are ready to be born again. Today you are ready to accept all that God has for you. If that's you, I want to remind you that that man's life, it was marked by more than just decoration and by being swept clean. It said that he was empty. And today, if you haven't accepted Jesus, if you haven't said yes to following Jesus, that is exactly where you stand. You stand empty. But when you're born again, when you're truly born again, you're not just a new creation. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. That means you're not alone anymore. And for some of you today, this is going to be the first time that you ever said yes to Jesus and you're going to get born again. He's going to set you free from from some stuff and he's going to fill you with his spirit. And I'm going to give you this opportunity, much like I was given, to come out from behind my seat and to come down front and to answer a good old fashioned altar call and to take down those decorations of, of trying to impress people and caring what other people think in the name of simply just wanting a deeper walk with God. In the name of knowing that you need change bad enough that you don't care what anybody thinks about you anymore. And I'm going to give you that opportunity. But before I do, I want to make sure that everybody in this room knows this altar call. I don't want it to be limited to to people that are getting saved for the first time or that are just rededicating your lives for the first time. Because sometimes we we segregate these moments of, of being in an altar call. And we think you can only answer it if you're getting saved or you're rededicating your life. But that is not the only invitation today. For some of you, this is simply an invitation to just come down front and ask God to, of course, forgive you for for where you've been, but it's an opportunity to say yes to letting him in to all aspects of your life. It is an opportunity for you to take down your decorations. It is an opportunity for you to just progress in your walk with God and maybe go to a deeper level than you've ever been at before. Hear me today, if this is you, I don't want you to be afraid of what anybody thinks about you. We are all in support of you. In fact, if I could take every chair out of this room and give an opportunity for the whole room to just get on our knees, I would do it. But we can't because I don't want everyone to have to sit on the floor. I don't want that for you. So today, on the count of three, if that's you, maybe it's for the first time, and maybe you're just saying, oh, I'm ready for more, and I need more of God, and you want to come down here, I believe that when you come down here and you get out from behind those chairs, you're going to come down here and you're going to have the same experience I had. You're going to find yourself set free from things that you've been dealing with. You're going to find yourself experiencing the love of God like you have never experienced before. So on the count of three, as the band plays, if that's you, we want to invite you down. We're going to have a prayer team that prays with you. But I want you to have a moment with God where you seek God and you feel his presence on your life. One, two, three. If that's you, the awesome.